Hello. Um, I got this recent resource from a place called the Think Institute about um, popular and useful apologetics questions, and I wanted to share it with everybody because it's useful <laughs> and popular. Uh, it's an apologetics question checklist, and there's 25 essential questions for general apologetics that are good to memorize and then use in apologetics conversations. Um, if anybody has read the book Tactics by Greg Kokel or Street Smarts, which is his follow-up, actually, I've got it right here. This is the follow-up book, by the way, um, using questions to answer Christianity's toughest challenges. Um, not an endorsement, but that'd be nice then um, you will know that questions are very important when doing apologetics. And the reason is, uh, let me give you an example. If somebody comes up to you and says, you're one of those Christians that believes in a uh, literal seven-day creation, I think it's just bunk. And then you immediately go, hmm, like say you are a Christian that believes in a seven-day a seven creation. You go, well, let me explain to you why it is that case, and you start to make your case. Well, you've got someone who started out disagreeing with you and doesn't seem like they actually want to have a conversation. Maybe they just want to uh, diss your worldview, and then you immediately counter with something that they're already going to dismiss. You're never going to get anywhere in your conversation. But if they come up to you and they say something like that, and then you go, well, what do you mean by that? How, how'd you come to that conclusion? Can you explain to me what you mean when you say that it's bunk? Then it's an entirely different conversation. And a lot of times people will say, oh, I don't know. I've had that happen in conversations before. Not on that question, on different questions. Um, and of course, all of them escape me right as I'm recording something. Um, let's see. Oh, a really common one that I hear a lot. So I talk to a lot of college students. One that I hear a lot is um, a variation of all truth is relative or I have my truth, you have your truth. Morality is even relative. I've heard that a lot. And that, that one's kind of scary. Morality is relative. Oof. But anyway, I'll ask people, well, what do you mean by that? How would you come to that conclusion? And a lot of times people go, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. That's just kind of that's just kind of how it is. It's kind of what I believe. Um, yeah, I don't really know. Uh, I I don't know what I don't know. And some people go so far as to say crazy things like, "I don't even know if I'm real. I don't even know if my thoughts are real. I don't even know if I'm having a conversation right now." Um, everything is relative. And um, <laughs> just asking that question, "What do you mean by that?" gets into a much deeper conversation than if they were to say something like that and I'd go, well, no, truth is objective and here's why. Because they're not going to, they're not going to immediately just, if, if you were to say to somebody, you should believe in Christ, and then they go, no, here's why Muhammad is uh, the real prophet and Jesus was not. You wouldn't just go, oh, well, okay, I'll be a Muslim now. That's not how that works. You don't just immediately switch your your um, worldview because somebody put a counterpoint ahead or in front of you. Um, and there's a place for those for sure, but asking questions will get you into much better conversations. So anyway, all that to say, um, here's this checklist. I want to share it with you. Uh, let's see. General questions to clarify the objection. First one, what do you mean by that? I mean, I've looked at this already. I kind of knew that. But what do you mean by that? That is that is question number one. If you've ever seen the show Columbo, uh, Columbo always asks questions. He's a detective. He always asks questions to get to the truth. And he'll be annoying with how many questions he asks because in the exasperation, his uh, the people that he's asking questions to will reveal truths just to get him off their back. And so... The first Columbo question that Greg Kokel talks about is, what do you mean by that? Uh, second one, is that absolutely true? Good question, because that starts talking about the nature of truth. Is truth just something that we decide? Is it you have your truth and I have mine? Or is there actually a real truth that's transcendent? Question three, by what standard? So that's another way of saying, how'd you come to that conclusion? 
or what is your authority that says that? Um, yeah, that's a good one. That's Some of these look like they may be uh, rewordings of the same question, but they're good to memorize anyway. Because uh, the next one, how do you know that? So three and four kind of sound a little bit the same. Uh, five, how do you come to believe that? So four and five are very similar, but this is about memorizing questions and then using them. So those are two different ways to frame that same question. How do you know that? That's an epistemic question. Epistemology is how you come to know something. Um, yeah, so epistemological questions are great for conversations. If somebody says, I don't think Jesus really did rise from the dead, you go, how do you know that? How did you come to believe that? Then you got a big conversation there. Uh, number six, if your objection were true, why would it matter? And in parentheses, so what? This again, seems like they're pulling from Greg Coco because he kind of talked about it that way. That's a really fun one. If somebody is kind of being emotional, and you have to be careful with this, um, if someone's being a little bit emotional, but you sense that you can diffuse them with a simple question, and they're making all these objections, like if somebody does a, I think it's called a gish gallop, where they bring all of these points up, and it's so much that you can't talk about all of the pieces, you can't refute all of them or address all of them, so you just kind of accept it just to get them off your back. I think that's what it's called. If somebody does all that, you just go, so what? What if it's true? Would it actually matter if what you said is true? Great question. Great clarifying question and fantastic diffusing question because it will diffuse a conversation that could absolutely blow up if you return their energy. Uh, that's why I say it's good for emotional questions. If someone's being really emotional and really energetic, you return their energy, that's going to spiral into a bad conversation. But if you diffuse it by saying, so what? Awesome. Uh, seven, if that were not true, would you become a Christian? That's a great question as well. Um, there's another way of phrasing that. If Christianity were true, would you believe it? But this one is specifically addressing somebody's objection. So people are likely going to bring up their biggest objections. They want to hit with their strongest punch, you know. Um, the God of the Old Testament is evil. Jesus never existed. You know, things like that. Big, big, um, big punches there. So you can ask them, and this is another way to kind of diffuse the conversation. It's, you have this big objection. If that were not true, would you become a Christian? Because they will answer pretty much one of two ways, maybe one of three ways. The third one being, I don't know. And you never really get anywhere with someone who just keeps saying, I don't know. The other options are yes or no. If they say yes, that's fantastic because you recognize what their standard of truth is, um, what their standard of not just truth, but something that they're willing to believe in is. Um, so you can have that kind of conversation and show them why Christianity is reasonable. If they say no, you know it's an emotional uh, objection and not an intellectual one. So that one will not be logic through. You cannot intellectual your way through an emotional objection. Uh, you sometimes will just have to be there for the person. If you have the opportunity with a like a friend of yours who has an emotional emotional objection to somebody like to something like that, one of the best things you can do, I think it's called the ministry of silence. Um, maybe that's one way of saying it. It's just to sit in silence with somebody. I mean, sometimes that's really all they need, or a hug. You bring them a coffee. You just be there for the person. Platitudes don't help somebody who is emotionally drowning. So if you just be there for the person, you sit with them. Oh, that's amazing. But anyway, back to this. If you're in that situation where you need to minister to someone in silence, it's not going to be an intellectual objection. So that question brings that out. All right. Questions about contradictions and logic. I'll try to go through these a little bit quicker because I'm rambling. Oh my goodness, I'm rambling. Eight. When you say the Bible has contradictions, what do you mean? So this is the this is number one again. What do you mean by that? But specifically about contradictions. And if you've ever seen that graphic, I've actually got a video on part of that graphic where um, somebody made a, a graphic of all the cross uh, connections within the Bible, all the times that it references itself, something like 60,000 cross references. But somebody took that 
and specifically kept all of the ones that seem to contradict one another. I have a little bit of a video on that one. I want to do some more because those cover all the bases for the general contradictions in the Bible. And the the actual poster itself, that you used to be able to buy a poster of this. I have a high quality version of it, but it's really hard to find actually. Um, that poster actually has some repeated uh, repeated contradictions and spelling mistakes and all kinds of other stuff. It doesn't seem like it was put together very well. But anyway, again, I'm rambling. Um, that is a summary of a lot of very popular contradictions. So I'll link that in the description. When you're talking about contradictions, you have to ask people, show me. Don't just accept it at face value. What do you mean by that? Where'd you, where'd you get that from? Number nine, what would be some examples of contradictions in the Bible? Give me actual examples. Don't just talk about it. Number 10, what makes contradictions bad or wrong in your view? Um, some people might object to this, this question by saying, oh, they're just pushing the goalpost, you know? They're just going to say, oh, you can have contra contradictions in the Bible and it'll be fine because just believe. That's not what this question is getting at. This is not saying, oh, we're totally fine having contradictions in our faith. This is saying, give me the exact reason you think contradictions are bad or wrong, and let's look at the contradictions you bring up to see if that makes sense. Because sometimes you'll have things that seem like contradictions, but they're really just variations in the text or something, and they don't actually have any substantive um, weight against the rest of the Bible. Like you might have a uh, two passages in the Old Testament. I think Ezra and Nehemiah both give, I think it's in Ezra, they give accounts of people that came back from Babylon, I think, and the numbers don't really match up. Um, and there's a whole debate about that, so look into it for yourself. But that, does that really negate all the evidence for the resurrection, for example, in the New Testament? No, it's entirely separate. So anyway, number, let's see, 11. Contradictions break the laws of logic. Are those real? Are those laws real or merely human conventions? So this one flips this whole conversation on its head. We started by talking about contradictions with somebody, and then you just go, I guess this is something that's good for a moral rel or a, a, a relativist, not necessarily a moral relativist. Contradictions break the laws of logic. Are those laws real or merely human conventions? Because if it's just a human convention, then who cares? Uh, somebody else could create a separate law, separate uh, laws of logic, and it's different from mine, but they're both equally valid, and who cares? But if they're actually real laws of logic, this is similar to the moral argument for God. If there are logical laws that are really real, they have to have a lawgiver. In the same way, if as if there are uh, moral laws that are really real, they have to have a moral lawgiver, and we'd say that that is God. 12. The laws of logic are propositions which require an immaterial, universal, and transcendent mind. See, that's getting at what I was just talking about. Do you believe in such a mind? Oh, so this is this one's just cutting straight to the quick. Um, it kind of just it kind of just takes the takes number eleven and just does what I just said, <laughs> actually. Uh, the laws of logic require an immaterial, universal, and transcendent mind. So it requires an immaterial mind because uh, the laws of logic are immaterial and they have to have their source in something that's immaterial, not something that's material. Uh, they're universal because they'd apply everywhere and transcendent because they're not just a human convention like the previous question said. So all those things, all three of those are attributes. I can never remember how to pronounce it. Attributes, attributes. Let's go with attributes. They are attributes of uh, God. That's uh, three attributes of who we would call God. So do you believe in such a mind? Great, great follow-up question. Um, I don't know if that one would be as useful for memorization because that gets kind of niche. If, you would, or if you're thinking about memorizing these questions, those first seven, those general ones, are you're going to use those all the time. But... These other sections where they break them, break them down into more specific ones, you're not going to use them as much. Well, uh, okay. The questions on morality, those are the next ones. 
you're probably going to use those a lot. 13, when you say God is evil, what do you mean by that? A repeat of number one, but specifically about God being evil. I had a guy talk to me recently and say, if God is all-powerful and able to stop evil, but then he doesn't, that makes God evil. And I was like, yeah, that does make God evil. But we're not at the end of days yet, so God still has plenty of time to remove evil. And he also gave people the means by which to remove evil from their lives in Christ, at least the penalty of evil. Um, and he promises to remove evil, to purge evil from us ongoingly. So... Yeah, his question, I thought, fell flat, but he didn't see it that way. And so asking him something like, what do you mean by that, was really good in that conversation because it helped me clarify what exactly he meant. I think he actually had an emotional um, objection, but I never got to that in the conversation with him. 14, according to what standard should we judge good versus evil? Why? This is about the moral law. If there's an actual transcendent moral law, it needs a moral lawgiver. Otherwise, it's just arbitrary. Um, and this is getting at that. 15. Do you believe morality is objective or subjective? Why? Okay, that's a restatement of 14. Kind of the same thing there. Does the standard of morality change over time or is it eternal? That's another great question because somebody could believe that uh, there's an overarching transcendent moral law, but maybe God just decides to change his mind sometimes. Some people would say the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. The New Testament, however, says that God is uh, eternal and unchanging. So there you go. Um, but that's a great question for somebody who believes that the Old Testament and New Testament gods are two different gods rather than the, rather than the same God. What makes moral obligations binding? This is 16. Um, what makes moral obligations binding? Hmm. I don't see much use coming from that question, but let's see. What makes moral obligations binding? So if you're obliged to do something morally, why are you bound to do that? Okay, yeah, that's that's also getting at the, uh, the idea of there being objective or subjective um, morality, but specifically an objective morality that we have to account for and that we are obliged to follow. That's good because that shows somebody, perhaps by using a question, um, let me back up for a second. A lot of these are actually making statements by asking questions, though. That's another thing Greg Kugel talks about, which is just great, because you get to kind of make your statement, but the burden of proof is on the other person, at least for the time being, because you're asking them questions about their worldview. Eventually, you follow it up with something you're actually going to um, make a case for, but starting out with questions is great. So if we're obliged to do something that's morally well, obligatory, that would mean not only that there's a moral law that's objective, but that we play a part in responding to that. So that's a good conversation starter too. 17, do moral laws require a lawgiver? Okay, that one's just coming out of the, coming out with it, cutting to the quick again. Uh, 18, why do you think it was, a, it was Christian societies that ended slavery? Oh, fantastic question. By the way, this one is really, really good for talking about abortion because the Christians that abolished slavery back in the day, their logic and their arguments for why they did that can be applied to modern abortion. Um, so you can compare, it's a one-to-one -one comparison, the people fighting against abortion nowadays versus the people fighting against slavery. Uh, a video forthcoming about that, by the way, um, about whether pro-life the pro-life movement nowadays is the same as the abolitionist movement back in the day, um, whether those those parts are actually a one-to-one -one comparison. Spoiler alert, they're not, but you'll have to see what I mean in a video. Um, that question can come up a lot, especially when you're talking to college students, because abortion is a popular topic, so you can bring it back to slavery, and then ask them, why do you think it was Christian societies that ended slavery? Great question, great question. All right, questions about science. Ooh, th these are going to be good. 19, when you say Christianity is unscientific, again, what do you mean? <laughs> say it with me, everybody. What do you mean? Or what's that meme from The Simpsons? Say the line, Bart. What do you mean? Uh, when you say Christianity is unscientific, what do you mean by that? Yep, great question. 20, why do you think so many of the first scientists, Galileo, Isaac Newton, 
Tycho Brahe or Christians. I hope I pronounced that right. I didn't know that Galileo and Isaac Newton were specifically Christians. I thought that, I can't remember. I think I remember hearing something about Isaac Newton being a Christian. Galileo, I didn't know that. Um, that would be a great question as well because it kind of makes a statement at the same time and you can, you gotta make sure you know what you're talking about with something like that. But you can say that to somebody and then they go, wait, really? Galileo was a Christian? And then boom, you got a big conversation about Galileo going. That'd be awesome. That'd be really awesome. I was talking to a student recently as well who had a kind of scientific background. She wasn't an atheist, but she was agnostic. And she was like, yeah, it never was really a thing for me. Religion was never really a thing for me because I grew up in a scientific household. And I was like, yeah, me too, but I'm a Christian now. And that piqued her interest. And she was like, really? Why? How, how did that of all things, you know, make you a Christian? Or how did you get to be a Christian now? Um, yeah, so if you talk about science from a Christian point of view, then you can get a lot of really interesting conversations going. Uh, you talk about the fathers of modern science. Oh, so many of them are Christians. Uh, at the very least, some of them were deists. Yeah, great question. Would you say science is the only way to know truth? Why or why not? This is a great question because a lot of people will say um, the physical world is all that's real that's physicalism, or things that can be known empirically via the scientific method are all that's real, that's empiricism. Uh, there's a couple other forms of that that I can't remember the name of right now. Um, yeah, I don't remember at the moment. But those are ideas or philosophies people bring forth that they say, essentially, the natural world is all that is. You can counter that with questions like, well, how do we get to things like justice or love or hate, these feelings that we have? How do we, or these concepts, not just feelings, moral concepts? How do we get to those from the from the physical world? Um, I was thinking about this the other day. Some people say Christopher Hitchens was someone who said this a lot back in the day that uh, love is just a chemical. You know, all these emotions that we have are just synapses going off in the brain or whatever. I was thinking about that. Maybe this is a simplistic question. I don't know if I'm being naive here, but I was thinking, okay, uh, I'm having a dream or, you know, I'm thinking of something, I'm picturing something in my head. Um, is that an actual atoms that I'm looking at in my head? Like, think about this. When you picture something or when you have a dream or a vision or whatever, um, or if you just think about, like, if you think about a red apple, you're looking at a picture of a red apple in your head. Is that actual atoms in your head that you're looking at behind your eyelids? Because if it's just like electrical synapses going off, and if if it's all just chemicals and, and atoms and whatever, would that not be what that is? But you don't actually see it with your eyes. This is a non-physical thing. You can picture it in your head, a red apple, but you don't actually see it, right? So that that cannot possibly be some kind of natural thing. There has to be some other thing going on there that's not material. Um, so great question here. You can get into conversations like that where you ask somebody, is the physical world all that really is? Um, okay, let's see. What do you think keeps the laws of physics, chemistry, and biology consistent over time? Fantastic question that gets to the idea of God being eternal. 23. Science requires induction, the ability to draw conclusions about the whole from particular cases. Why do you believe in induction? Okay. Kind of assuming a little bit there. Um, but I guess if somebody says they're a scientist or they believe in science, they're going to have to believe in induction because science requires it. The ability to draw conclusions about the whole from particular cases. Um, this may be related to inference... What is it? Inference to the best explanation. Eh, that's kind of related. But induction would say, like, here's this phenomenon we'd see with a certain species of bird, or a couple members of a certain species of bird. Therefore, we, we believe it's likely that this same thing would happen to the entire species of bird, or maybe even other species of birds, you know, something like that. Um, induction. That works with things in the physical world. It also works with uh, laws of logic and philosophy and morality and all kinds of stuff. It's not just um, that's not just a thing that is 
related to science. So you can get into a lot of bigger conversations there as well. 24, do you believe the human mind is aimed at truth or merely survival? Sam Harris would love this question. Uh, Sam Harris and a bunch of other of the neo or new atheists uh, kind of view morality as whatever is good for human flourishing. And you could maybe summarize that by saying merely survival. Um, if it's just about the survival of the species, let's not get into talks about eugenics, which we totally could uh, with that kind of conversation. Is the human mind simply aimed at survival or truth? Uh, because you, if it's just about survival, why not lie? Oh my gosh, why not lie all the time? Lies are super helpful, especially in the short term, if you're just talking about survival. Yeah, great question there. And then the last one, uh, I have rambled on for, I can't even tell. I'm not even sure how long I've been recording for. Uh, <laughs> 25, Einstein was shocked at the correlation between the math in his head and the ways things work in the real world. How do you explain it? Um, interesting question. Huh. Einstein was shocked at the correlation between the math in his head. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, it's like the idea that the math that we have in our heads, this abstract concept, can be mapped perfectly to the world around us. How is it that this thing that's in our head that's actually ab abstract, you know, by our own definitions, it's abstract, it's non-physical. How is that able to be mapped to the real world? Oh, that is a deep question. Uh, related to Einstein, if you don't know about this, look up Einstein's fudge factor. Real short story. Einstein was trying to see, uh, he was formulating his question or his um, equations about general relativity and wanted to kind of prove that the uh, universe was eternal. So he inserted this fudge, fudge factor into his equations to make it work for an eternal universe because his equations uh, came to the conclusion, they forced him to come to the conclusion that the universe had a beginning and he didn't like that because that implied a creator or a source to the universe. Um, yeah, that's another really good conversation to have. Um, I hope those were helpful to you. And um, I'll put the link. This thing is free if you want to get it. I'll put the link to it in the description. And you can get the PDF for yourself and then work on memorizing the questions. All right. See you next time.